Hi, my name is Miriam, and we're going to be doing this presentation in English, but I do speak French. So just in case you don't want to ask a question in English, you can uh, do so in French. Now, why am I speaking today? It's rather simple. Um, I have a bit of a problem after 10 plus years of doing SEO. I still get questions that are legitimate, mind you, where I will go up to a developer and go, by the way, are we optimizing the website for SEO? And I get told, I don't know, I'm reusing the content the client gave me. And then I pause and I go, okay, so this person doesn't necessarily realize that there's a whole wide range of SEOs actually. So today we're talking about the technical side. First and foremost, I learned that one you always define what you talk about because I've had people discuss highly technical details of my job and still tell me I do CEO in life. So what is SEO? Well, it's everything you can potentially do to improve your website's organic visibility. When I say organic visibility, it means you show up in search engines and you're not paying for ads. That's it. Great. But we all still get those clients that want to be number one in Google. I know that you've heard this many times over the years. The newest one I got was, uh, could you just slip my business card in Google? And I still don't know how to answer that question. But it's real. People really want this visibility. They just don't know how it works. So how does it genuinely work? Lots of ways. So. Your search results and my search results, if we do a search at the same time in the same room, will be different. There are reasons why. Your browsing history, your location, your browser language, if you're logged into Google or not, if you're on mobile, tablet, or desktop, if people in Google Plus, yeah, yeah, that is still going on because it's great for data and machine learning. So this is still going on. And your email, if you use Gmail. But on top of all of this, you of course, have a lot of other things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, videos, images, knowledge graphs. Your page can be a jungle. And if you don't think it's an ever-changing situation, you're wrong because I've tested this query in multiple countries in multiple dates. Why? Well, because I think um, this lady is amazing. If you don't know her, she was in Golden Girls and many other, other things. And what I find absolutely fascinating is to learn what people are searching for and how machine learning at Google works. Betty White is almost 100 years old, but what you may not know is that people really, really want to know one thing about her. How old is Betty White compared to Spice Gray? <laughs> now, let's not go and blame machine learning on this. I think at least 10% of you are now wondering this for real. The answer is, yes, she is. So the whole point is, results change a lot. And they're impacted by three big things. The three pillars of SEO are code, content, and links. You can have the best content in the world. If the bot cannot access it because you decided to go all angular because it sounds fun without any pre-rendering, it will see nothing. So congratulations, you are showing nothing to people. The other problem is that you could have the best code in the world. I mean, it's the most readable thing. I have a friend of mine, codes only in HTML. It's responsive, it's black and white, it looks awful, but it works for Google. That is not good for a user either. So that's important. But you also have links, because I don't know if you've noticed, but everybody is a leader in a field, or here, we would call it chef de file. Yes, but we're all the best, of course. Everybody is the best. So Google has to deal with thousands of websites popping up every day saying we're the best at whatever. So they check. And the way they check is by your reputation, your word of mouth, people pointing to your website from theirs. So quick story, um, be very careful with your links. We're not going to be talking about this today because that's more PR, we're here for code. But I had a client of mine who was specialized in sausages and Google kept thinking that she was a um, Catholic charity. Why? Because this lady donated a lot of her time and money to Catholic charities 
And they thanked her by linking to her sausage website. So she was popping up on all those charitable queries, but sausage was not getting sold. So how does Google read a website? Once again, we're in a bit of a technical UX course. We're talking about the bots, emotions, and the way it perceives your website. Well, first of all, it starts by crawling. If your website cannot be found by the bot, period, on the web, you already have a problem. Then it's indexing. OK, so the bot found your content, or maybe you submitted it in the Google Search Console. But it needs to index it. So it really needs to check everything. It will process the content, the code, anything that's on there to really get a grasp of, hey, what is this about? And then it will serve results. And that's the ranking part. So whenever people tell you, I want to rank number one on, that's great. But I'm not sure they know that they first need to you know, be crawlable and be indexed. So when you serve results, there's 200 plus factors that can play into your ranking on a request. That's a lot. So we're going to check out the ones that you can influence when you actually develop a WordPress website. Here's how you can make sure your website can be read by Google. That's the first step, OK? And a lot of people think that magically Google can read anything. Yeah, no. No, 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 no. Usually, and I copy-pasted this, I did a test for, for a website that I know. If you get this result, um, this is how Googlebot saw your page in Google Search Console, it's bad. So how do you check that Google can read your JavaScript? OK, there are simple ways. Number one, you have access to your client's Google Search Console tool. It's a free tool for webmasters to actually know what Google sees. You can ask Google to show you. But if you don't have access, you're not dead in the water. Don't worry. You can use fetch and render in a third-party SEO crawler. So for example, Screaming Frog, which is a crawler, and SEO tools have a tendency to have really intriguing names. I don't know why. I'm guessing it's a marketing ploy like ZZ Top that wanted to be last. And the CD selling business. But you can download Screaming Frog or, Frog or another crawler, and it will do a fetch and render for you, too. You can also disable JavaScript in your browser and see what pops up. If you have nothing, here's a hint. It could mean that you have a problem. And there is another one, and that's the number one, Google Cache. If you go in the search results, you will have a little triangle next to the URL, and you can see the cached version of the page. If your cache has nothing, you have a problem. You need to check it out as a developer. So next, I'm not going to go into details because I'm pretty sure everybody keeps telling you this every single time, but performance really matters. Here's some news. Um, Google decided that speed is finally important officially. So what does officially mean? Officially means that you may have problems getting visibility in mobile search results if your website is not fast enough for mobile. Concretely, what does it mean? You need to make the right choices in terms of hosting. I'm sure there's a lot of sponsors that want to talk to you about this. They can help. Optimize things server side once again. Go check out the sponsor. Optimize your cache. Hmm. Hosting can do half of it, but the other half can be handled in WordPress. So now it's a question of choice as a developer or a website owner. Do you want to go with a free solution and risk having a PHP error or having to debug something where your specific problem got talked about online three years ago and nobody replied? Or do you want people to support you, handle it, and make your website faster? So there's paid possibilities and there's free possibilities. It depends how well you know caching, how much you want to get involved with this, and how much you want peace of mind. So there's multiple options and we can discuss them um, outside. I'm not doing any affiliate marketing today, sorry, haven't had time or ethics for that. So you can compress your images and I'm going to give you one very important tip here. Google page speed lies. Okay. I see everybody is shocked. So the problem with images is that you have multiple algorithms to compress your images. So different ice cream flavors, except that Google picked one. So if you don't have the same flavor, it's going to tell you to keep optimizing things, and your clients are going to keep asking you to optimize it because Google said so. 
So be careful about that and run other types of tests when it comes to images, OK? Optimize JavaScript, same thing, Google lies. Google will tell you that you really need to optimize um, their own AdWords JavaScript or their own Google Maps type of stuff. Great, you still can't, I'm sorry. There is no magical bullet for this. I'm just here to tell you, yes, sanity check, you were right all along. Make everything <laughs> asynchronous and optimize your CSS, please. I have seen some inline CSS, um, I don't want to say nightmares, so what's beyond nightmare? That, that happened to me recently. Don't, don't do that to people. So Google actually has stats on this. I handle it a bit differently. Normally when I go and see a client present an SEO audit, I will have a loading animated GIF. And I will stare at them dead in the eyes for as long as the average load time is. And let me tell you, 14 seconds with a virtual stranger dead in the eyes is highly uncomfortable. You don't want to do that to your users either. But if you don't like these mind games, you can also show this graph. And I have included um, a link to this study made by Google. So the next time your client tells you, oh yeah, speed is not that important to me, Fine, but if you're making money with your website, hint, it is. I can't tell you how many times my husband has to get up and check if the modem or the router work in my house because a website is too slow. I already blame my internet provider, just right off the bat. I think the entire house is broken down or that the entire internet is down when my favorite websites aren't on. Like This happens a lot, so don't let people down, please. Semantic content. We're going very, very fast because I'm sure a lot of people have very precise questions at the end. And I'm this bad mix of speaks very fast and speaks a lot. So we're going to go through this and then I promise to answer questions. So semantic content. Why am I using semantic and even content when I keep promising that it's a technical talk? Well, because code gives meaning to the content. It gives context. It's very important, especially since Half of the context you can provide in HTML5 is not really processed by Googlebot because I don't know why, I'm hoping. Hi, can you make it happen? Did you see this video? Okay, good. So beyond all this, if you need to specify something in Google, you have a few tags. We're gonna go through them and I'm just going to explain what they mean and you have links to documentation for this. Canonicals, so. The problem with Google is that when I got started doing SEO, everybody was ripping everybody else off. I mean, entire websites, like the code, the content, I mean, the copyright, it, it was sloppy. So Google decided, okay, let's penalize people who steal content. And then it began, problems, different tags, authorship, People claiming that their content got stolen and the content that got stolen was number one, then syndication and all this. You do not want to get involved in the politics of content. However, you can help handle some of these problems that seem to be content related in code. So, use a canonical if your content is duplicated throughout the website and you want to tell Google, hey, I have to do this for my client or for UX or for information architecture purposes, but if you have to show one page, it's this one. That's the one you show. So this is very interesting. It's very interesting because you can apply this across multiple domains too. So before we go into corporate stuff, here's the fun bits. If somebody wants to steal your content, you can also have an automated canonical pointing to yourself, which a friend of mine did, and um, now she is making sure that her own content stays visible. Medium, the platform you all know, had these issues as well. They had to implement canonicals because their user base was going, okay, it's great that I'm here, but I'm losing my own website's visibility. This is a no-go for me. They had to implement that. Pagination is the same. If you write multiple series, four parts to a series, specify to Google, here's the first one, here's the second one, third one, fourth one, you can do so. Why is this important? Well, Google will understand the order and show this content in search result pages to your users. So you have an additional chance to keep that user captive when they come back. When I say when they come back is because, I don't know if you've noticed, but if you go on a website and come back to Google, 
things change in the results. Now there's machine learning that makes these boxes pop up with extra links. This helps. Rich snippets have been discussed in a conference here. So rich snippets are just a way to make your content pop in search engines. Okay, so if you want the little stars, if you want calorie count, if you want any type of information that could act as a call to action for a user, go with rich snippets. And what you may not have noticed in the Betty Page screenshot is that even Betty Page's team, yeah, her developer team uses rich snippets because her social media is showing on the right. That's only done through code. You need to specify that Betty White has an Instagram account for it to show up in Google. So if Betty White knows how to choose her devs, mm, maybe you could be good enough to enter her team and then get me an invitation, please, after this. No? Oh, okay. Well, I have hopes and dreams like everybody. So Open Graph is something that is not necessarily SEO related purely, but it's kind of like rich snippets for social media. And guess what? For me, if it has a search bar, it's probably a search engine. So Pinterest, search engine. Facebook, search engine. You want to make sure that this is good, especially since now uh, Facebook, for example, doesn't necessarily always allow you to change the visuals or the description. So you may have a community manager that is a bit angry at you if you do not plan for this. Content hierarchy. So content hierarchy is very, very important. And oftentimes it falls in, in the background and then people notice that it's a problem. We'll go through that, but basically your H1, H2, and H3 tags, they have a lot of meaning for Google to help them understand what you're talking about. And if you are a mountain resort and the first thing you say is, sign up for this newsletter as your H1, Google is confused. So am I. But that's just an SEO thing because I check websites that way. So last but not least, no index. You do not want this to show up in Google? No index. Very easy very clean, you need to think this through. Because for example, if people can apply for a job and upload their CV onto your WordPress website and the folder ends up indexed, like one of my clients a few years ago, that's called a lawsuit waiting to happen or currently happening. It depends where you are in the food chain. So, Languages are a huge issue in Canada or well, in many other parts of the world actually, but since I'm here, it's important to me here now in Canada. We need to get a few things out of the way. Number one, the URL structure is important. So if you have a French and English website, slash en slash fr. If you want to be obsessive compulsive or have English from Canada and English from the US, then you need to specify en ca dash ca en dash us. That's your choice, it helps you manage things, but you need to avoid putting this information in variables because Google doesn't understand it. You may also have clients that are using different domains. So for example, .fr, .ca, .com. If you want to know exactly how to specify something to Google saying, you know that English page you love and you place like number one on a lot of queries and that page in French you really don't care about? They're the same? Can you give the little ugly duckling a little love? You have that power. So there's many, many ways hreflang can be badly implemented. If you want to debug it, it's through the Google Search Console. If you want an actual example of a company that is killing this, like doing it very, very well, Airbnb. I mean, they have an Airbnb for almost every single country. Look at their hreflang in the code, it's just so long. It's, it's almost storytelling, like you can tell they've been all over the world. So. Make sure that this works and it, this could help your content team quite a lot. It could also help with one problem. Um, have you noticed that everybody complains that there's French results in English queries and vice versa in Canada? If you haven't, you've been very lucky. I've had many VPs get on the phone with me and scream at me as if Google was going to listen to me if I called them up and went, you got the language wrong. Or you have people telling you that I don't wanna choose my home pages key language, I want the user to click on a beautiful pop-up. Yeah, nobody enjoys your pop-up, just number one. Number two, it doesn't work because this could be an obstacle to Googlebot. Depending on how you code it, it could not go through. So you need to ask your client, we need to have a page. We need to redirect this. What is the key language you want to market in or be visible in? 
Otherwise, Google will be confused and uh, will decide to do something a bit unusual. So it may be Franglish in the description, it may be nothing, it may be everything, or you may just have, you know, the English results and then site links, so the little pages that are recommended underneath it be in French and in English and useless, basically. So clean that up, please. Metadata title and descriptions. Yeah, I know you know all about this. So first things first, whenever an SEO talks to you about meta titles, for you, it could also be called SEO title, it could be called title in your code, it could be many things. SEOs refer to this as meta title because this helps us understand, you know, meta title and then the content title, which is the H1. Okay, so how do you handle this? Number one, 70 characters max, make it unique per page. If they're telling you to take care of it and there's no content, you raise a flag. You do not copy paste that stuff. This will hurt your client. Now, one little thing that nobody ever tells you. A dash is to continue an idea. A bar is to signal something entirely new. So, when you describe what your page is about, you describe it first and then you put a bar and your brand name usually after that to say, okay, this has been brought to you by. Because if, for example, um, WordCamp was giving makeup advice, WordCamp being included by a dash, saying I'm slightly changing my idea but it's still the same theme wouldn't make sense. WordCamp putting a bar and then WordCamp Google will understand, okay, these two things are related in some way, but they're not a continuation of the same idea. Okay. The other thing is, um, meta titles count for SEO, meta descriptions don't. But meta descriptions are a way for your client to handle their marketing. That's how you convince people to click. For me, a recipe that has 40 um, ratings on it that are five stars versus one that doesn't have that information, guess what? I'm clicking on the one with the stars. That's a user behavior. So you as a developer, what can you do? First things first, your client doesn't provide you with meta descriptions. What do you do? Well, you don't do anything. Google officially advises you to do nothing and let them handle it through machine learning once again. So this may end up in a sliced bread versus Betty White situation, but at least you know that this is the best practice you can tell your client. What do you do with meta titles that you need to optimize? Well, sometimes you can actually write scripts that will optimize these, especially for huge websites that have a lot of products. Then you ask your client for a title nomenclature. You ask the content person or the strategist. I can automate this, but what do you want? Product title plus something else and then a bar and the brand? You think about the length. Can you automatically remove the bar and the brand if it's too long so that way you save your client? It's all about making sure that there is no pebcac, that you do not leave a door open for stupid things to happen when somebody uses WordPress. And I know it's very difficult because people are highly creative and destructive. So be smart about your scripts. Meta descriptions, well, 155 characters max. I know Google did a test recently with 300 characters. Please stick to the 155, that way you will avoid having clients complaining, but I wrote it and I don't wanna go back and you told me the wrong thing. No, you told them the right thing for that week, sadly. So stick with 155, keep you safe. It's unique per page. Once again, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all in the meta description. And it should convince the person to click on this. If you are going to put something random, Tell your client, this is probably not going to work and uh, we may do the SEO efforts, but it may not be successful. So, images and videos. JPEG is a great format for SEO. I know that SVG is gaining ground, but it's a bit difficult to place an H1 on uh, an SVG format. It's a bit difficult to add an alt attribute, at least in my world, I still don't understand. I read the tutorials. If somebody can help me make this easy, let me know, SVG will be there next year. So compress your images. Usually clients will tell you that they are compressed or that the designer did something. Um, Google is not the only thing that lies in life. Don't ever trust that. Test it yourself, there's a few tools. If you go on Imagify, they let you test it for free. So you can literally show your client going, hey, your page? No, nope, not optimized. Your camera didn't do the magical work. Provide an alt, so please do that in the right language. Don't have, you know, English for French content. This is confusing for Google. 
Name the files properly. 001.jpg never made me dream. I'm sure no one dreams of that. Videos, pick the title, pick your first visual, use open graph, and hint if, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of marketing websites will have transcripts. Helps you rank in SEO. If you need to market in multiple languages, oh yeah, you are translating those transcripts and positioning yourself. This will help you a lot. If you want to know the power of treating your videos right, um, check out YouTube. If you look for Britney Spears Toxic in Google, you will see that it's Britney in her little flight attendant suit and you're like, okay, I'm safe. I know, I know the song, I can show it. Well, if they had left it at the first screen, it's like pterodactyls in a fiery sky descending upon the plane. It's not going to convince you. So be very careful about that. I had clients that kept putting raw chicken first visuals for like roasted chicken recipes. That doesn't work. Show me the end. Yeah. So SEO assets, stop wasting your SEO work. If you have a 404 page, be very careful and redirect it. Little things for you. 301 is the first thing you want to do. Permanent. You pass a good 60 to 70% of your assets. If you do this correctly with a 301, that is one to one page. 30 to 40% is when you're doing, okay, I'm going from one specific page to a category page that is kind of like it or the home page. So you see there is a huge difference. You have to be careful about redirecting. 302 Google gave up and is passing equity now because nobody wants to acknowledge that 301 is the one you should do. 302 is great when it's temporary. So temporary out of, out of uh, stock product, your client wants gone from the website, this is good. Sitemaps and robots. This is all I'm going to say. 50K extra URLs, you're good. You 50, um, 50,001 URLs, you need to start a new sitemap, okay? You can use a sitemap for different types and they're very interesting if you have news, for example, if you want to show in Google News. Robots, well, there is only one thing I'm going to say. Please don't think you can no-index pages through the robots file. You can't. It has been many, many years. Mobile SEO. If you want to test AMP, you can do so. There's plugins. It's a bit difficult to maintain if you want everything to be perfect. And I've noticed that my clients actually have better conversions once they remove their AMP pages. So visibility, great. Conversions, eh. But depends on the industry, so check it out. Test if things are mobile friendly and remove pop-ups because if they're too big, they cause penalties in mobile results. Website architecture. If you have a choice between a folder or a subdomain, you go with the folder. Ranking a subdomain is much harder. So languages, I will much prefer a slash fr than a fr.domain.com. The other thing is, it's not just website architecture. Test your page's content hierarchy and see if it makes sense with something like the Web Developer Toolbar extension. It's in Chrome, it's in Firefox. It lets you see how your H1 and H2s are organized in the page. Picking the right host. Uh, and Oh, sorry, picking the right host and the right template. I just want to say one thing. This was an SEO optimized template that was touted as number one in Google. So I checked it out really quickly with my extension. And as you can see, they are specialized in nothing followed by nothing, and then they do big data analysis. That's going to help me with my SEO. So before you buy a, um, a theme you think is SEO friendly or SEO optimized, check it out and do your own audit first. Does it load fast? How about the images? Does it resize them in the browser? Like all the investigation you can do. Optimizing URLs. Make sure there is no garbage in your URLs and that they're easy to read. That's easy, but usually clients don't understand that URLs need to be rewritten, so explain it to them. Best practices, keep them short, keep them in the right language. No capitals, no emojis, please, please don't do that to me. They're very hard to read and they must follow the website hierarchy. If everything is on one level, it's going to be hell to redirect, hell to understand for Googlebot, hell to navigate for users. Link best practices. Could you add breadcrumbs as a rich snippet? That would be awesome because it helps us navigate. Make sure you do not neglect internal links. If your 404 page and your terms and conditions page are the most linked on your website, maybe you need to tell your client that a UX person should go over it or that they need to include sidebars. Penalties. Guess what? 
most of the websites that get hacked today for SEO reasons, just to place links because links are big business. So if you get hacked, usually I'm the person who knows because I'm the person who sees all those weird Japanese or Russian queries in there. So be very careful about securing your website because clients will care about this and owners will, do, will too. HTTPS is the weakest moment when you could get hacked. So be careful when you switch. And last thing, because people ask me that a lot, this is what the web developer toolbar looks like. You go in information, you click on view document outline, ta-da, you get back to the little visual I showed you. Here, you get to see a visual representation of your work. Easy peasy. So, that's the last thing. I included a checklist. Make sure your client has Google Search Console and that you've submitted the sitemap and robots file. Use an SEO extension, whichever you want. Pick the right theme, optimize caching so it's fast, right hosting, redirect 301. Make sure that WordPress is SEO friendly by removing the tags, categories, or other junk that could end up in the URLs. Compress all the things and we're good. So if you have questions, it's now. <laughs> 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 I will be trying deep diving soon because I think I have the lungs for it now. Yes. Um, I can tweet it out as soon as I'm done. And you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, my name is Miriam, M-Y-R-I-A-M. And Jessier, J-E-S-S-I-E-R. And I have imposter syndrome, so you don't have a slide with that information, I apologize. Yes. And hopefully this has been optimized enough that when you Google all of this, you will find one of the links. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sorry, the lady behind, uh, before you, yes. Um, in terms of indexation, you I would check if the sitemap that you submitted in Google Search Console is going well. I would diagnose why these pages are not getting indexed. Is it mostly images? Is it mostly blog posts? Is it mostly something that has been badly translated? Because I've had issues with rendering. I've had issues with um, WPML badly translating content. So then basically the whole content from Germany disappears. Like It depends on what the problem could be. So you need to audit this and try to figure out what the boo-boo is. So that, okay, duplicate content if you're a developer, I wanna check quickly what is going on. Well, actually, if you're a human being and can type. Um, S-I-T-E, site, two dots, put in your domain name. You go at the end of the results, like if there's 20 pages, you click on 20 and you keep going. At the end, Google will say, in order to provide you blah, 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 legal, 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 we have omitted 340 results from this query. You know you have duplicate content if you have this. Sometimes it's harmful, sometimes it's not. Yes. Oh, wait, could you, W, what? Okay, I'm going to repeat um, a few of the questions we were asked. First, we had a question about, I forgot. Okay, sharing the document, we have answered that. Another question was clients having indexation problems and I gave the answer, audit why this is going on. And the third question is Google recommends something very specific for Im image handling that is called dot web webp. I do not know what it is, but I do know that Google offers a compression algorithm called Quetzli, which means cookie in German, I don't know. I do not know the one you're talking about, but um, no, I don't know. I have nothing else. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. So there's different things. First of all, if we're talking accessibility. Oh, I let me repeat the question. What is my opinion on H1s um, and having multiple H1s in the page? I have lots of opinions, sir. So number one, if you're doing this for accessibility reasons, Multiple H1s are accepted. Now my problem as an SEO is that there's rule of thumb and there's rule of dumb. 
So rule of thumb is you can have multiple H1s in a page, but rule of thumb is that your clients will most likely abuse it, or you will most likely abuse it when you code and have empty H1s or H1s that make no sense, like on a form that says, oops, we're sorry. So that's an awesome H1 to have in the page. Uh, what I would recommend is, rule of thumb, one H1 so it's easy for Google to understand what you are talking about. And Google is not up to date when it comes to HTML5 standards. So contextual information in an H1 going, hey, this is a sidebar. Hey, I have an H1 in my footer. That doesn't help. You really need to focus because if your client is talking about making an omelet with mushrooms, you should not have contact us if you have a problem and chat with us live as H1s. So those are my opinions. Yes. Okay, so, so there's multiple things when it comes to performance, and I'm going to leave this open to you, but here's how I handle it. Number one, you know your client is going to use Google PageSpeed or GT Metrics. So first things first is work with their tools to understand why they're scared if they come with this report. Be ready to debunk some stuff. Second, your client will most likely use Google Analytics. So ask to have access to this because you, as a technical person, have access to three different types of reports in Google Analytics regarding performance. You can check the pages that bring the most money that are the slowest. I think that's very important to your client. That's what you could start working on. You could also be focused on experience. So I would look at time to first byte because although most websites that I, that I audit are under three seconds or two seconds, when I check time to first byte, it takes almost half a second to start loading. So the experience is most likely horrible and you may lose people through that. So you have to be careful. And in extreme cases, you have some clients, their websites are so slow that even Google Analytics doesn't have the time to fire and let you know that a user saw the page before the user just leaves. So by covering like what your client expects, what the data with the money says in Google Analytics and time to first byte, you covered basically business, UX and developer according to your clients. So that helps you round it out. Yes. Um, Um, Google always focuses on two things, never giving the proper information fully, so I don't have that answer. And the second thing is, they have a relentless focus on user experience. So I would go with time to first byte, that's meaningful. I would literally test this out and go, as a user, am I hampered in 3G? Like if, for example, I'm stuck in the metro waiting for this to load, is this still enjoyable? Am I getting the information? That's what I would try. Is there, I think we have time for one last question, is that it? Yes. One person from this side, thank you. <laughs> yes. Yes. They are the worst thing you could ever do. I, okay, so like equals, e, da, 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 yeah. It w so there is literally a documentation where they have a table on there on Google's documentation where this is placed at the bottom and says, if you have no other choice, do that. So that's the thing. Google sponsors also Angular and it's horrible for me as an SEO. So I still don't understand how this works, but it's the truth. Like sometimes you will have some features where you're wondering why they did it this way. And the answer is doi. Yes. Yes. Yes, because then Google will understand if you're looking for um, this, let's say, law firm in English, it will show the slash en automatically. It doesn't have to choose. And if you're searching for the French version with the word avocat, it will know that it will show you the slash fr. There's no cannibalization. You don't want your own website to battle itself between languages. So that's the best way we found. 
Yes. Yes. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect, but that's all I can offer. No, I, it's never perfect, and that's why most people hate to love me and love to hate me. Oh, my. Okay, I understand. Whenever you say last question, there's like three more. Is that, uh, am I cutting? Okay, how about this? We're not doing one more. I'm going to head out this way. We're not going to hamper the people coming in, and you can talk to me over a drink and ask the question. I promise I'm not going to run. Thank you.